so the first question that you have um, is actually the third one listed. What are infection control points you envisage being required beyond the well-known? And the well-known, of course, washing your hands, but then there's different versions of that as well. And wiping down surfaces. And of course, there's depends what surface and what you're wiping it down with. So there's a lot that gets involved. But so perhaps in your response, you know, bring those up. But um, beyond the those two, cleaning surfaces all the time, washing your hands all the time, what other things do you think that needs to be looked at beyond the blatantly obvious that most people would understand? And I'm just throwing that out for everybody and we'll see how this goes. So is anybody wanting to? Otherwise, I'll get dictatorial and point, or at least I'll say, uh, Terry, I'm, I'm happy to open the batting. Yes, room. good I'm, for I'm, you, I'm, Lawrence. I'm, Hello. Um, I guess if you are approaching it from a sort of purely global health WHO point of view, you'd say that you know, people who clearly are symptomatic with a respiratory infection are going to be in someone's you know, close space in their breathing zone for a period of time, depending on the nature of the procedure. So doing some effective telephone triage, for example, when you're confirming a visit with a client or patient the previous day, checking that they've been well, those sorts of basic things, which are actually part of the sort of standard things we're doing at the moment. I suspect they will actually continue on for, for quite a few months. And indeed, every year, they're very appropriate during winter at the peak of the influenza season. Mm -hmm. Anybody, I'm opening it up uh, for a panel discussion, basically. Well, I mean, the other thing, obviously, is spacing your appointments out. So, you know, at least um, have enough time to deal with the patient and get them out of the surgery, not, wait, not have a, you know, not having a full waiting room. Um, the social distancing measures inside the reception area, um, you know, possibly even um, it shields at reception to protect the reception, the reception staff, things like that. Just the pure um, booking and scheduling measures you'd need just to space people out appropriately. And that's a really good point because it's not just as it has been, we try and back them up almost. You've got to have that space for that client to get out, do your re-cleaning, next client comes in and that's going to you're going to see less people per day, definitely, but you've got to, depending on the treatment, of course, rearrange how your scheduling and how your appointment setup is controlled. Yeah, and I, Can I, 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 I would agree with that. I would agree with that, Ron. So um, definitely, you know, spacing the appointments out so that you've got an adequate time to clean in, in between. Um, you know, just some of the basics, the hand sanitising stations that you're seeing everywhere at the moment, ensuring that you're screening your patients correctly pre-arriving pre, um, to their appointment, and then also doing it again on the day. And being also quite comprehensive in those questions is going to be important. Something like, are you experiencing cold and flu symptoms may need to be expanded a little bit further. You know, do you have a runny nose? Do you have a cough? You know, because some people, you know, don't really know what flu-like symptoms are. Um, we're actually taking temperatures, so we're advising um, our, our staff to take temperatures and, you know, to be turning clients away that are um, febrile, being 38 or above. Um, and we're also, um, you know, changing our consultation process so that with the consultation process, particularly in cosmetics, you might be quite close to the person, you might be touching their face and trying to show things, you know, quite early on. And instead, taking a step back and, you know, staying as far away as we can throughout that consultation process, trying to maintain that 1.5 metres and then only touching the patient when absolutely appropriate. All right, Jennifer, would you, yeah, you're going yeah. in now. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're following on from what Jacinta said, we're promoting the same sorts of things along with screening the clients and triaging them, uh, making sure that that um, time that we're spending with the client is therapeutic. And so it is the time that we actually do need to be touching the, the client or the patient. And if we can do consultation and skin health screenings and education over the phone or virtual, then trying to max maximise that as well so that the time they are with us is as short as possible and it is purely therapeutic. So it really is changing some of those behaviours and, and not being so touchy-feely, I suppose, and, and taking that step back as well. And this brings up a whole new, and it was mentioned, um, you almost have to have a pre-consult consult. consult we've got to consult them before they even get to the front door. So how do you think that should be? Should there be a pro forma form that may be sent out, emailed as much as you can prior to their contact? Can I answer that, uh, Terry? Go on, Nivea, yes. Yeah, so like, the, the most important thing to understand is the at-risk patient is the patient who is 
asymptomatic. Yes, it's young. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so in a cosmetic setting, that is everybody. So if you do not apply social distancing measures and all the public health measures, one asymptomatic individual can transmit the disease to 20,000 people with a couple of hundred deaths along the way. Okay, this is a very sobering fact and there are plenty of uh, examples and I think I'd like to quote one example from a church choir in uh, Washington state where they oh, yeah. formed all distancing measures and took all precautions but the choir group had one person who was asymptomatic, but just getting into that phase where that person was getting infected, right? And the singing was you know, obviously quite enthusiastic. At the end of the choir, out of the 62 members in the choir, 32 people ended up having COVID positive with two deaths, mm. right? And all because of close proximity and loud singing, nothing else. Mm. Right? Is that infection um as you mentioned it's the asymptomatics and then the aerosol spray basically aerosol generation yeah so, uh, so in, in terms of coming back to a question um a lot of us have been uh, sort of uh, uh, asaps is put out in conjunction with ascda covid19 guide and one of the things that we sent out along with that guide that's downloadable from our website which anyone can access is there is one pro forma there that you can it's a digital one you can send it to your patient upon booking and the patient gets informed about here are the following steps that are in place in our clinic to mitigate your risk mm -hmm. and please tell us that if you have any of these symptoms so before the patient hits the clinic the patient gets to see in an electronic format email or text the list of questions that you may get answered so you may get asked as well as and with the with the caveat to say like if you do experience any of the symptoms please come so it is a rep repetition and the constant reminders that needs to be done to facilitate behavioral changes yeah true true david and tina we haven't heard from you so anything to put in david Sure. Um, look, I um, echo Naveen's concerns that potentially anyone is going to be infectious and it's the asymptomatic people that, that are really the ones that are a danger. People that have obvious symptoms are not going to be allowed to come to the clinic. But, you know, as a general practitioner, I see people all the time, even without fever or very, very mild symptoms who end up having flu, for example, and I'm sure we will see that with coronavirus. Mm. And I think this is not about safety as much as risk mitigation. I don't know that you can put down a set of safe guidelines. It's about assessing each individual and recognising that the risk is not just patient risk, but it's risk to the staff, it's risk to the healthcare workers and the public. And what you have to institute is effective measures to be able to evaluate each and every person as they make a booking, they come to your door, and to keep everyone in the process um, safe. Um, and like I said, that includes your staff as well as the patient. And I'm, you know, it's, the point is that when we do what we do, you can't effectively keep that physical distancing to do these procedures you need to be close and general, generally you're going to be spending enough time in that room to be considered a close contact should they um, become should they become positive at some point in time so guidelines are good but a really solid understanding of this is transmitted and the sort of things that you can do with every person and how to adapt from person to person is really vital in my opinion yeah, absolutely. And it is that close contact, you know, the 1.5 and the four meters and all that, that's understandable. But that goes out the window real quick as soon as you get the patient in doing hands on. And particularly if you're leaning over them, you know, and we'll get to that PP and mask and which one should you be using anyhow, particularly in very close face to face contact. Tina, I'll just bring you in because you came in a little bit late there. We were just talking about anything um, beyond the normal, like washing hands, etc., uh, in terms of infection control, that should need to be thought of, given what we do. And you're on mute at the moment, Tina. Need to unmute. Well, while she's 
and I don't know, Tina's uh, picture has frozen, so I'm not too sure if she's, oh, she's back. Okay, can you there hear you me now? Now we're right. working. Okay, wonderful. Okay, uh, one of the areas that that our people have looked at is um, in in terms of risk management. Uh, there was a concern that we should examine uh, not only uh, start with starting with the staff about whether there is autoimmune conditions in uh, in the staff themselves, and also if there are autoimmune conditions within their family. For example, we had one case where uh, the staff member had a cancer patient at home. So they felt that their risk um, was much higher than the others. And they also suggested that we incorporate that in our evaluation form when we are assessing our clients is to look at the level of um, vulnerability that perhaps a patient may have that um, we may not consider and also uh, their home environment and the risks within that environment. So it's these are a couple of things that we've added to our consultation and our recommendations. Right, important point because it's not just the patient, well, two points actually, not just the patient, but associated with the patient, that could be problematic, and the staff and the associated members around the staff member. So without getting too technical about this, I'm just wondering how far removed would you be looking at in terms of your staff personally, if you've got staff, um, if they've got somebody at home and has a high risk category, whether they have symptoms or not, uh, would you then recommend that that staff member not show up or are you going to take it almost day by day and what are you going to do about that? Well, the screening for them will be both on arrival and on departure. So on departure, they take their temperature as well as when they arrive. And they also look at, um, you know, their, their symptoms. We take a closer look at their symptoms uh, in terms of, you know, um, how they're feeling and, uh, but also utilising the temperature assessment both at the beginning and as well as at the end. Um, yeah. It's really up to the, the staff member whether they feel they would like to come to work uh, but really, what, what it's about risk assessment and determining how well that immune system is going to function and how strong it is to withstand any potential risk that may occur. So it's something really that the, the, they, we recommend that the, the employee themselves um, give us their feedback of how they feel about their risk percentage or um, situation where they feel they need to, um, you know, maybe not be there when it's very busy or um, what they believe will, will be the best risk management for their situation in their home environment. So a good point and I'd like to broaden that out to everyone now, the risk management of this because the staff self-isolating uh, is ideal but may not happen because uh, they want to go to work and make money. So what mitigating factors are you gonna, can somebody put into place in a clinic practice situation? And I'll go through the entire panel. So maybe Jennifer, since you're up top my screen, you're top left, so you get first. Um, I think that's something that, um, particularly in our area, we have to think about because as you mentioned, there are a lot of um, businesses have uh, contractual um, employees, so they're um, casual workers, and so that, that they can be concerned about their, their job, I suppose, and coming in needing to be paid. So I think it really is considering how can those employees remain employed, um, and as I said, mentioned, those are things who are doing virtual consults and things as well, perhaps they could be doing things online. So assisting with more administrative tasks, um, following up patients and doing the, those sorts of things. So they're not working in close proximity and hopefully hopefully working from home, doing those sorts of things as well if they are needing to self-isolate, but they can still have working from home arrangements. So I think a lot of employers are going to have to think about, um, you know, work from home arrangements and, you know, policies around illness and, you know, illness in, in their children and people they might have to care for as well, because if they've got uh, children or you know, partners at home that are sick, then 
are a close contact, then you may not want it to come into work either. So I think that employees are going to have to think a lot of those sorts of HR kind of perspectives. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, David, um, have you, you've instituted quite a few things uh, at your practice, I know. Um, what would be, though, for other people, mis risk management to ensure that their staff are showing up and their clients also, of course, in a sort of healthy manner? I guess we're fortunate at our practice. It's even though there are people that are contracted to work as well as a mix of employees, it's very much a team environment where everyone works together towards a common end. And we've been able to instill that culture. So at our particular practice, if someone is unwell, they're quite happy to put their hand up and we're quite happy for them to take the time off. Um, I agree with what Jennifer said about trying to find alternative work for them. It depends a bit on the sort of work they do. Administrative staff can be easy to do, to have work off site. Um, in a general practice setting, you can do um, telehealth off site, but that becomes a little bit more problematic when you're talking about an aesthetic practice. Um, someone raised before the idea about um, doing some remote consulting beforehand to assess people's well-being and whether they're able to come to the practice uh, and certainly they could do those sorts of things but then the financial reward for that may become a factor depending on what sort of arrangement there is with the practice and I think that each practice will have to determine what works for themselves. I guess what I'd like to say finally is that in, I believe that the days of soldiering on with Codrill are well and truly over. And we really need to be able to instill in, in society that sense that if you're unwell, you're potentially infectious and you could make a lot of people sick and you could cause people to die, certainly in the foreseeable future. And hopefully, you know, Australia has done very well so far pulling together. Um, we just need to reinforce that message and keep it going. And Jacinta, your thoughts on easy, well, not even easy, but risk management strategies that could be and need to be put into place. Yeah, look, I absolutely agree with what David was saying. Um, it's all about that cultural change and what he said, the, you know, that soldiering on is, I think it really has, COVID has changed, I think, Australia's opinion of turning up for work and being unwell. Um, but in terms of the risk management, when you're talking about someone that may have a family member that at home that's immunocompromised or is considered in that high risk category, I guess it's up to every family to make that decision. And it also comes back to those asymptomatic car um, carriers. You know, if you're going to work, you know, and you're in touch with a patient that may be asymptomatic and you could potentially be picking that up, we need to think about what precautions we can take at that point to protect us from the asymptomatic carriers. So I think that's really leading the discussion into PPE and what PPE is going to be appropriate to actually stop that transmission at the point there. Um, you know, in the hospital system, if someone is wearing um, the appropriate PPE around a COVID positive patient and they're wearing the appropriate PPE, they're deemed not a contact. So they're able to go home and be with their family. So I think we need to start thinking about what sort of PPE we're gonna put into our practice, considering we can't maintain our social distancing with what we're doing. So what PPE are we gonna wear that's gonna protect us and protect the public? I wanna keep the PPE for a moment. We'll just park that because that's a big area anyhow. Um, of course, the risk management notches up quite a bit when we get to surgery. So bringing in Naveen uh, first, perhaps Naveen, and then Ron, perhaps. Um, the added, you've got added complications, true, in the surgical sense. Um, given that everybody else is not necessarily in surgery per se, um, can you say what risk factors though that are important that you have found that can actually relay to other uh, clinics and such? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, th I think surgery, the couple of things that are distinct from a clinic visit. Number one is the journey, the interaction with surfaces, the number of patients, as well people you get uh, come in contact with. Uh, the actual procedure of intubating a patient and extubating a patient are mm. independently risky. So I think the protocol demands that while the patient is being intubated and extubated, the anaesthetist 
takes adequate precautions of barrier and other things, plus the other surgical members stay out of the uh, anesthetic uh, uh, room. So I think, and apart from the fact that there's a possibility that one of your, your patient whom is ha who's having the operation could well be a COVID positive asymptomatic patient, uh, puts things in perspective because there was a study from China early on when they had the incubation period and they found that the mortality rate of asymptomatic patients who underwent a wide variety of surgery was in the vicinity of about 20%, right? These are patients who underwent an operation not knowing they had COVID positivity. So that I don't think those numbers are going to be reflected here just because the prevalence is different and the weather patterns are different, but it's something, it's a sobering fact to consider. Mm, absolutely. And Ron, sorry to keep you waiting there for a yeah. while. No, I'm essentially similar to what Nadine said. I will add, I mean, Nadine did rightly point out that the intubation extubation period is the most risky part of the surgery in terms of the contact during the procedure. But um, also the, the nature of the surgery. So like if you're working around ENT surgery, it's just a lot riskier than um, um, doing breast and body surgery, um, surgery cosmetic. So, so the area you're working on is also influenced about, but you, we, well, generally as surgeons, we always um, have universal precautions, you know, with, um, in, in mm -hmm. while we're doing the procedure. It's more, as Naveen pointed out, it's the, the run up to the surgery, the amount of interaction they have with the, with the various staff, the surfaces, um, now the other question that we question should we be possibly um, performing swabs on patients before surgery? I um, mean that's something that's open for discussion at the moment, um, the day before. All right. Okay. Can, can I answer that uh, swabs on patients? I think uh, yeah. it's it's a well um, uh, it, it's a, it's a good strategy because it'll probably help uh, help everyone know before going into the operative procedure that the patient is either negative or positive or whatever. But there is a couple of variables there that are quite um, uh, concerning because the reliability of those pin tests that tests your mm -hmm. antibody exposure is not 100%. And not a single test, in other words, one test alone will not be able to accurately reflect your antibody status. So you need to do two tests a week apart. Um, and then if you think you're positive, then you have to supplement that with the nasal PCR testing. So it, all of a sudden the process becomes quite cumbersome. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other important fact to realize, this was a paper that was published not so long ago, that uh, the two weeks prior to you exhibiting any symptoms, you are still infected. So that is the rationale for why you have to quarantine for 14 days or thereabouts. So it's, it's, there's too many variables there to pinpoint, but I think uh, if you were to keep it very simple and find, it, find a reliable pinprick test, uh, testing two weeks, a, a week apart, sorry, seven days apart, yeah. would give you a good profile. Mm -hmm. And Lauren, bringing you back. Uh, you're on mute. <laughs> My apologies. Um, yeah, some practical things that we can do, for example, in a small office-based uh, medical practice, for example, would be to think about what all the patient high-touch surfaces are and make sure that there is a protocol for doing those, uh, all those door handles, the rails on the side of chairs, all those sorts of things. Um, in dental practices, for example, you'll notice if you go now, there's no magazines. Get rid of all the things that people pick up and hold mm -hmm. that you can't actually wipe down. So uh, ditching those nice glossy magazines, unfortunately, pff, those things have to go. We know from looking at the, the data for people who have a high viral load who are symptomatic, that the R naught value, how many people they spread it to, goes from three up to about six and a half to seven. So it's really important that we keep the people who are symptomatic away but there's also good indications that, as everyone has discussed, that the, it's the asymptomatic patient who you don't know. So one of the things in my area especially we've done is to have all our patients do a pre-procedural mouth rinse. Well, that lowers the amount of non-enveloped viruses and enveloped viruses in the saliva component at least by over 90% in about 20 mm. seconds. Now they can still cough and sneeze other things, but that one simple measure can actually reduce it a lot. So if you are doing something in the ENT area, that's a very simple intervention. And there's been quite a few studies around that, looking not only at coronavirus, but of course, lots of other viruses too. Mm. Good point. And I was gonna bring this up if it sort of came up, so I'll mention it now and I'll throw it out. Um, in terms of mouthwash, even just a normal, alcohol-based mouthwash. Uh, should every client get one of those? It's going to help marginally, perhaps, or significantly 
it's not going to do anything for the virus per se. Um, well, actually, there's quite a fair bit of studies. We've done studies looking at the effect of mouth rinses on bacteria, and there's quite a big literature on viruses that do show that your common things like um, you can get from the supermarket or pharmacy, so cloexidine in the form of Savicol, either with alcohol or without, Listerine with alcohol or Listerine zero without, hydrogen peroxide, povidone iodine, they all give relatively similar reductions in about the same magnitude, with one exception. The cloexidine is not very good against, against uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Mm. It's actually one of its biggest deficiencies, whereas things like uh, Listerine essential oils are actually very good. So most dental practices have gone to using peroxide, povidone iodine, or Listerine zero. We like the alcohol-free ones because you can use them in a patient of any age. If it's swallowed, it's not a problem. There's no religious objection to contacting alcohol. You can use it in alcohol-restricted communities with alcoholic patients, et cetera. So we've just found it just solves a whole bunch of problems. Yeah, I think it's a good little um, measure to institute. It might seem a bit weird, but uh, it can be really helpful. Yeah. Can I ask um, Lawrence um, a question? Uh, oh. In your opinion, um, what... Yeah, that's careful, that's module. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask what, um, with the mouthwash, is it straight or diluted? Oh, that, that is a question. Um, you would normally use it straight if it was a commercial mouthwash. The one you have to mm -hmm. dilute, though, is peroxide, because if you get it from a pharmacy, mm -hmm. it's normally 3 or 6%. So you need to dilute it to 0.5%. But the other ones, you just use one, one capful straight from the bottle. All right. Any other comments around the other can thing? Was, that or some? Sorry, can sorry I, Tina. I'll just get Naveen yeah, okay. at the moment. So, sorry, um, one, one, one factor has been uh, kind of missed in the beginning, not, not in this panel, but uh, elsewhere. The, the risk of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is possible through tears, because if you look at the anatomy of your uh, um, internal structures, your oral cavity, nasal cavity, and the yeah. uh, eyes are the same thing. And uh, so eye protection, you cannot prevent people from tearing. So eye protection is something that uh, the practitioner has to use, right? So it's important to use the mask, but at the same time, you have to use an eye protection mm -hmm. as well. And uh, some, some may argue that if you were trying to inject something that is not around the periorbital area, uh, should you give the patient a pair of glasses, like very much like, uh, you know, a splash proof or laser proof glasses, because this has been proven to be, but to, to be the case. And I think that's an important factor to consider. And I, I agree with uh, Lawrence with, about the mouthwashes. That's an important, very important part, uh, uh, very uh, ignored, and but important. Mm. Right, yeah. All right. Since you've mentioned masks and uh, other PP, we'll get into that because there's a lot of confusion out there at the moment, I think, um, in the general populace, certainly. Should I wear a mask if I'm outside? Uh, but in just bringing it back to the clinic situation. We'll go through the list um, and we'll start with masks because there's a big area there and there's a lot of confusion, I feel. I think we all will know the difference between, you know, a medical mask, surgical sort of thing, um, a P2, N95. Um, and could I just, having said that, sorry, a new thought. For the listeners, if you're a bit confused about what all of these numbers are, what's a P2? as opposed to an N95, well, it's really just a standardization that they have to meet for in manufacturing for to be useful in terms of what they actually can catch, as it were, in their filtering, whatever that may be. So, and S, uh, S2 is the Australian version, N95 is the American version out of NOSHA. Uh, they are interchangeable, so, and then as we get into the panel, I'll actually ask about the valve in these masks because there's a lot of confusion about that because they are one-way valves rather than a two-way that a lot of people think. So firstly, masks. Uh, should you come to work with a mask or sh where should you have a mask on at work? Anybody, anyone? Going once, going twice. 
<laughs> Jacinta, I'll, I'll just pick on people now. Lucky me. <laughs> so um, our policy is our policy is that um, if you cannot maintain your social distancing when you're, which obviously you can't in the cosmetic industry, then we believe that it would seem better to be able to put on your PPE once you breach that 1.5 meter meter um, distance. So for us, um, we believe that surgical masks are appropriate, and we don't have to go to the N95s um, because we're not really doing any procedures that are aerosol generating. Um, with the surgical masks, um, I'm sure you're aware, Terry, but there are also different grades of, of mm -hmm. the surgical mask, um, you know, one, two, three. And I believe at the moment they're trying to save the, the third one, which is for the hospitals, because they're more splash resistant. So in terms of my cosmetic field that, you know, that we represent, we don't really do too many procedures that would generate enough propellant to create splash. So I don't mm -hmm. think that we would necessarily need the level three mask prefer to save them for the professions that need them. Um, so really a level one or level two surgical mask would be appropriate. Um, and also what's also you know, equally as important is obviously the donning and the doffing um, because it, there's no point in wearing it if you're not going to put it on correctly or if you're going to remove it correctly. That's very important point in terms of the, the N95s, for example. You really got to know how to put it on properly. And I've seen some versions that are not quite doing the job. And um, removing it properly because there's a huge risk absolutely. of contamina contaminating yourself yes. um, if you don't remove it correctly. True. Mm. So, Dr. Bessick, maybe I can bring you in. Uh, thinking about masks. Yes. Well, I mean, I mean, similar to um, what Jacinta was saying, I think um, we have our reception staff do wear masks. Um, um, all our staff do and change them regularly, even if they're not breaching the, uh, potentially breaching the 1.5 um, meter social distancing rule, but that's just, a, that's, we just decided to add that as an extra level of safety. Um, we think we, we should change a mask between um, treatment episodes. Um, and we think, you know, in terms of just injectable practices, sure, uh, a level one or level two surgical mask would be sufficient. Mm -hmm. and, and also in, in, gen, in, uh, in our in more invasive surgery, breast and body surgery, uh, level one or level two masks would be sufficient in that area too. But with uh, with uh, fluid protection on the, uh, for the eyes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anybody oh, else? Yeah, just before, there's um, the, the the confusion. There were also these Chinese K95s. Oh yeah, <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but yeah. So I mean, I mean they're quite, not quite as good, and they're not regulated there in Australia stands, But they were, a lot of people have purchased those and think they're equivalent, but they they possibly aren't as good. Or, or and, and the quality control is very very. So you should just be aware of that. Hmm. I want to bring up that specific point a little bit later. Where do you get your PPE? Because there's a lot of places where you don't want to be getting it from. Uh, Jennifer, can I bring you in in terms of dermal therapists and such? Um, where should they be using the masks? Should they be wearing it all day? Hopefully not the same mask, mind you. Um, similar to what Jacinta said, we um, advocate the moment that as soon as you breach that 1.5, you should be wearing a mask. Um, but there's lots of things to take into consideration before you even think about whether you should be wearing a mask. I mean, we need to use masks um, for occupational health and safety. For We do produce, um, produce plume and things like that when we're doing laser. We use machines that will produce particulate um, so we do have exposure risks of, you know, mm -hmm. under normal circumstances where we need to use masks. And so we're really advocating for rational use of that sort of thing. So at the moment, given the current situation, um, clinicians are being um, advised to use their clinical decision making about whether they should be doing those procedures at this point in time. So um, perhaps using clinical decision making about using a procedure that doesn't produce those sorts of byproducts at the moment, so they don't have to use those. Um, higher grade masks when they are going to be needed somewhere else. Uh -huh. um, so that's one thing. But then, yes, once they you know, are doing as much consulting as they can and triaging beforehand, and then as soon as they are with that client therapeutically, they will need to use a mask. But as Jacinta said, it's really the putting on and the taking off and even the using it. Um, when people are using masks all the time, you know, there's quite a few studies now reporting the inconvenience aspect of that. And you know, your speech slurs when you have them on all the time. And you know, they do get moist and so people don't like using them for a long period of time and so you tend to find they might be wearing their masks like this you know yeah. not even covering their nose or anything so um one of my pet peeves um so it, it's really about you know making sure that you are really using them when you need to use them so that you can use them correctly as well yeah, absolutely it's knowing which one to use when you 
use it how you use it, and as you mentioned, how to get it off uh, without spreading everything else. So it's been great that you're wearing the mask, but then anyhow, let's move on. Anybody else got anything specifically around masks at this moment, David and Lawrence? Uh, oh, we're putting hands up, thank you. <laughs> David, yes. Um, I think when you're thinking about masks, at the, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to achieve? Mm. Are you protecting the patient or are you trying to protect yourself? Because the two may be the same, but they may not be the same. Things like plume, for example, create a whole new set of um, complications. So in general terms, surgical masks are used to protect other people. They're spit guards, I guess, for want of a better term. Um, if you're really looking to try and protect yourself because you're going to be uh, doing a procedure, well, hopefully you won't be doing a procedure that's aerosol generating in, a, in an aesthetic practice, but something that you're going to require uh, significant droplet precautions for, you know, you need to consider whether or not a P2 or N95 mask is appropriate to protect yourself or your staff at that time. Having said that, um, I use them most days. I hate using them. They're horribly uncomfortable. Um, you need extra time before and after to put them on and off correctly. And, you know, you need to consider whether or not you should be doing those procedures where you're going to be putting yourself at risk at this particular point in time. Mm -hmm. I think things will change as time goes on, as we get more experience with the natural history of the condition and exactly how contagious it is in all sorts of different situations. But the main point I want people to think about is are you trying to protect yourself or are you trying to protect the patient that you're treating? And that will help to dictate what sort of mask you use and when you use it. Mm -hmm. And Lawrence, you had comment? Yeah, so um, David gave an excellent response there. Um, I was one of the people who wrote um, Australian Standard 4381, which of course is ah, the Australian yes. Standard for Disposal Mask. So uh, as a result of doing that, I'm often asked to rate different masks that people have looked at coming in from uh, you know, Brazil or China or whatever. And one of my rules of thumb when I'm looking at the specifications is that nearly all the masks in the world, which are high quality, get tested in Utah at a place called Nelson Laboratories. So if the supplier sends you the actual independent report from Nelson Labs, which gives you the bacterial filtration efficiency and the particle filtration efficiency, if they meet what's in the table in the 4381 standard, then you know you've actually got a high quality product. I've seen a lot of products which have been inferior when you compare it to that. And they might say, oh, this is CE marked or it's got some other thing. But unless it's been through Nelson's lab uh, in the US, that is essentially the great testament of a really good high quality mask. And that's just a bit of a advice. And if, they, if you contact the supplier and they say, who's Nelson Labs, <laughs> then I'd be worried because mm -hmm. that's really the place that every good mask company in the world goes because they do nothing but just do mass standardization testing for the whole world. Right. Okay. Can, so I, just I, think, say, can I just say thank you, Lawrence, because I think that's really, really important information that I think a mm. lot of people listening today will be able to take away. That's excellent. And that sort of leads into something I wanted to get into is not so much, you know, brands or anything, but where do you or do you not get your PPE from? Because there's a whole lot of suppliers out there from blood tests to gloves and everything in between um, that are just flooding the market as it were so if you're looking at a mask for example then since we spoke about that where do you go does the local beauty supply place is that really the place to be or do you need to go to a medical supply or and then, as you mentioned, um, where does it come from? Who made it? What testing has it been in terms of the particle? Because people just, if they don't know, will just buy a mask and that's it, but be totally useless. So anybody's got ideas about what you really should be looking for when buying PPE, not only masks, mind you. Throw that open. Mm -hmm. Lawrence? 
I just might make one comment. Um, I've seen people who've gone to Bunnings and bought an N95 dust mask. Yes. That is a different thing altogether uh -huh. because it's not designed to withstand fluid splashes and it will get moist from the inside and soon become unusable. But I've also seen people go on eBay and buy an N95 mask and when they've paid seven or eight dollars a mask, it turns up it's exactly the one from Bunnings for about one or two dollars each. So it's uh -huh. one of those caveat mTOR things you need to be very careful about things you buy on eBay because they might just be industrial masks, not actually ones designed for, for patient care. Yeah. I know um, there's, you know, yeah, don't buy from the internet, generally speaking, but what do you need to look at? Even if you're in a, you know, distributor's warehouse, what concrete things would you look at or what would you try to ascertain to figure out whether this is a good buy or not. So David, um, you had a question or, no, a comment, sorry. Um, I was going to answer the initial question that you'd asked. I guess with a general practice background, mm -hmm. we're fortunate we've got um, well-established supply chains through many of the medical suppliers. We use probably four or five different ones. Uh, we've also got the support of the primary healthcare networks who provided um, very limited numbers of, of personal protective equipment, but we've been able to, we, we had stocks and supplies in our general practice anyway to start with before um, COVID-19 started. And we've been very proactive in just making sure that we badger our suppliers for the sort of equipment that we need um try and estimate how many we're going to use and and just work off those forecasts i think you need to be prepared you can't just do this at the last minute and and shoot down at bunnings to get a box of masks or or i've seen them at aldi um and i think i saw some at office works as well recently so they're sort of popping up all over the place with a hand sanitizer now uh, but you need to have good reliable commercial supply chains, I guess, and if you haven't got those, I mean, you, you may as well start connecting with people and, and trying to make some inquiries about uh, sourcing quality equipment from them. Terry, Anybody, can I Terry yeah. Oh, Tina, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I became aware that uh, we went to the government and asked if they could give us any recommendation of what to look for, and apparently, they have a registry where um, people that want to manufacture or in introduce um, uh, any any of these products, whether it's the mask or the gels, and they, one of the questions that they ask is, has your product been TGA approved or FDA approved? And they are looking for, um, and what they've created is they're looking at quality and then you can ring the government and get um, a, a recommendation of a supplier that meets what they consider to be the gold standard of, of um, safety. So mm -hmm. I know that uh, they now have a direct um, directory both in Canberra and in the various states. Uh, so if you're looking for a credible uh, manufacturer, you can contact the government and they can tell you which companies have met the best standards. All right. And you say the contact the government seems to be a bit big. Yeah, so I anywhere know, in particular? I have, uh, well, the uh, federal, federal, I went to the federal health minister and they, their department then connected me to Canberra. I would, I'll have to get the details and I can forward them if anyone's interested. Um, of the various departments that, that are handling it. But they have uh, what they call COVID um, uh, working groups that actually uh, uh, examine the various applications. So they do have um, a focus group that basically that's their task. It's a task force. So mm -hmm. COVID task force uh, is really what you need to ask for um, that will, uh, can give recommendations of the appropriate um, brands or manufacturers and where they can be accessed. Right. Yeah. All right, thank you. If we could get that info, that's good. Okay. 
Um, Lawrence, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but should the should, if the marks have to go through um, the AS4381 uh, testing regime, is there any marks on the actual boxes that come into Australia that indicate that they've gone through that, or is there another standard? I thought I saw on um, on some marks an ASTM standard that we can use as a bit of a quick indicator to see if those marks are suitable. Yes, that's uh, that's right, Jacinta. So the American Standard of Testing Materials ASTM Level Two, if they're marked as ASTM Level Two protective mm -hmm. surgical masks and if you run a search on the FDA registry and they're listed then they're exactly the same. In ones made for Australian market will have the AS4381 compliance printed on the box as well but essentially all the ASTM level two ones are equivalent. Mm -hmm. Good yeah and that's it you've got to be looking at <clears throat> the box basically to see what that says if it says absolutely nothing then that's probably a red flag in itself. <laughs> Can I ask a question, in, yes. to Lawrence? Yes. <laughs> AS4381, um, is that, does it replace the TGA approved tick mark or is the TGA approved tick mark necessary? Oh, it's a different thing. I mean, TGA regulates, as you know, medicines and devices. So it really depends on whether there's any particular therapeutic claims or anything like that. So for, for PPE, things like the NSMRC infection trial guidelines that came out in May last year say that you need to follow 4381 and use the appropriate level of mask according to the splash risk of your procedure or a surgical respirator, which sits under a different standard. The 4381 only covers the disposable surgical mask, level one, two, three. Yeah, so, okay. yeah, so it's, a slight, it's a slightly different part of the regulatory loop, but effectively you wouldn't want to get pinged using a mask that wasn't suitable under 4381 because that would, as a medical practitioner, put you in breach of the NSMRC, which is a professional standards issue with the Medical Board of Australia. So, yeah. Right. So are the masks approved by the TGA that are not compliant with AS? No, or, or, or to get that, you would have had to tick that box off. Yeah. Basically. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just broadening it out, the PPE, um, any comments about gloves, gowns, um, and even the um, splash um, visors, whatever? Um, I don't want to sort of preempt anything. I've got a few things, but... Um, no, I, th I think in a, in a, in a clinic, clinic setting, if I can answer the question, in a consultative clinic setting i don't think it's necessary to be uh, wearing a gown or a big visor because if you look at all your procedures uh, it's primarily consultation and a procedure which is a low risk short duration procedure and technically non aerosol generating so the aerosol generating procedures as we say just take some extra precautions either you delay them or you do them in a, in a short period of time because the 15 minute contact with your patient in close proximity is what is required for a spread and anything less than that is seen as not adequate to be a clinically valid spread so um, eye protection is mandatory for the practitioner for the reasons i just mentioned earlier and um, surgical masks would suffice and stand-up gloves would suffice um, on top of that you obviously have to um, perform things like hand and surface hygiene before and after every patient you've seen, plus surface decontamination and uh, whatever uh, other methods that you do to decontaminate the surface after every patient visit. I think those would suffice in the current uh, uh, situation that we are in at the moment. Mm -hmm. Anybody other thoughts about general PPP, David? You, Yeah. Um, I guess I spoke with you a couple of weeks ago about this, Terry. Yeah. Uh, at our practice, we come dressed in our civilian clothing, if you like. We put on um, clothing that we wear just at work, which are scrub-type clothing, basically. Um, we wear surgical masks. When we're doing procedures, we have disposable gloves. There's eye protection. Um, I think the thing to recognise, again, is that the healthcare worker or the staff are potentially at risk at some times, and people may consider neurotoxin injections, for example, to be low risk, but people that have done those sorts of procedures also know that if you're treating the glabella region, there's a certain proportion of people that will get a sneeze reflex as a result of it or cough. So consider whether the patient needs a mask when you're doing those sorts of things. You're not treating the area around the mouth, 
but they may well, mm. in fact, cough or sneeze in your face whilst you're treating them in, a, in close range. So um, I guess, again, you need to think about who you're trying to protect, what the risks are, and sometimes they're not obvious. Like I said, neurotoxins are normally considered low risk, but it may not be. And obviously, if you're talking about dermal fillers and you're working around the mouth, then that's a whole new um, area of risk as well because of the saliva that you may be coming into contact with. Again, maybe that shouldn't be happening at the moment until we know more. I know a lot of the recommendations I've seen that suggest that should be put off as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, if I can bring in Tina and Jennifer, just um, because I know a lot of in clinical aesthetics or dermal therapies, uh, scrubs are the, the thing as a uniform more and more. And I've seen a number of people just arrive from home in their scrubs, do their thing and go back home again or do something else. Is, should that, if that is happening, what's your recommendation there? as apart from don't do it. Uh, if I may just briefly say, um, part of our recommendation in our protocols is that uniforms must be worn uh, at the workplace and removed at the workplace. So uh, you're mm. not to arrive with your uniform and you're not to leave with your uniform. So we've ad added that as part of our um, policy. And I agree with Ron on that. Yeah, quite. Jacinta, you have and then, oh. sorry, I was, sorry, Jacinta, I meant to say Jennifer then. I know you want to say something, but Jennifer, have you got anything further to that? Uh, we say the same thing, that um, they, they should be not arriving in their uniform. They should come in street clothes and bring the uniform with them or keep the uniform at work and then take it off and take home to wash it or have the laundered at the work as well. But I guess there's other things to consider. It's not really been a big thing in our industry, but whether or not they need to shower and wash their hair and things when they go home as well. Um, and making sure they have sort of a routine around those sorts of things just to make sure that they're decontaminating to a certain degree uh, in that sort of thing as well. So I guess mm. there's a few different things we might have to start concentrating on. So in terms of that decontamination before you leave the premise, as it were, um, what do you think could be reasonable? Because obviously um, many places won't have showers and certainly don't have decontam units, etc. Uh, so what is reasonable, though, really, at this point? That could change, of course, very rapidly. I think it depends on the risk of the procedures that you're doing. So, you know, obviously we already advocate that, you know, your hair should be tied back quite firmly and things like that. So that's sort of preventing some of that happening mm -hmm. as well. But, and again, uh, limiting the amount of procedures that we're doing, we're going to be having any exposure to plume. But if you are going to be doing that, perhaps you need to wear a hairnet yourself um, rather than having to wash yes. your hair and those sorts of things as well. So... It's really taking into account those hierarchy of controls whenever you're doing an OHNS audit, really. You know, what can you prevent from happening? You know, what sort of mm -hmm. controls can you put in place? And if not, then use PPE. But obviously, PPE is pretty poor control. So that's our last resort. Right. Jacinta, hello again. <laughs> hello again. Um, I was just going to add, um, you know, if we're wearing uh, surgical masks, we're assuming that we're taking, you know, droplet precautions. So we would argue that an apron is appropriate to wear um, if you're not going to be changing, you know, your clothes before you go home. But even, you know, some procedures, you're actually actually leaning quite close to the patient and you may even be touching them with your clothing. So that's really just to protect yourself. So, you know, bare below the elbows is obviously really important for your infection control. So you can wash your hands effectively. But I think we think that an apron is appropriate in this situation. If you're wearing the mask, you should wear the apron. In terms of the full face visor, I think that's only really appropriate if you think that you're at splash risk, um, because that just gives you that further protection. Mm -hmm. So um, again, it's just assessing the risk of the procedure you're doing. If it's a low risk procedure with minimal risk of splash, I don't think a full face visor um, is necessary. Mm. It's that splash, um, though, because it's we're not talking about you know major hemorrhage and blood coming up into your eyes routine. But um, if you're doing something and the client actually sneezes, that is the unknown in a sense because you don't know they're going to do it. Mm. So should I wear a visor just in case at that point, or just do I have to react really really quickly to get out of the way? It's hard to say, but, you know, what David was saying before, sometimes you do um, initiate that sneeze reflex. So it could be as simple as just warning the patient beforehand, hey, this might make you sneeze. Can you let me know if you're feeling that that way, you know, and just yeah, standing back. So. Right. 
standing back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else got any thoughts, questions at that point? Yeah, can I just add, right. add, a, add a bit of a statistic to this? So the standard surgical mask is capable of preventing 99% of droplet from the person who's wearing it, mm. right? So David's point is taken. I think it's a very good practice to have. And I think if some of your patients walk into your clinic wearing a mask, just uh, it's, it's quite appropriate for them to use it. Uh, people have been using a term called source control, and it basically means that not any single modality is going to be helpful. You want to layer modality one over modality two, and the cumulative effect of all this is the one that's going to give you the results. So you start off with the questionnaire and the temperature screening as a start off measure when you walk in, then followed by a simple measures like uh, 1.5 meter distancing, uh, non social as a non contact greeting cough etiquette explained and all those things plus surface decontamination and you have to wash your hands and your face before your cosmetic procedure and they recommend that the uh, difference between washing your hand five times a day as opposed to washing your hand 10 times a day is statistically significant so they recommend do it as often as possible as frequently as possible and as a routine once every two hours so if you repeat those standard measures and uh, observe guidance such as eye protection, mask protection, as well as or rinsing and other things, you, you can pretty much control this. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to you know, not get too carried away. We've got to be protective, certainly, as mentioned, for our clients, but also for ourselves, etc. cetera. Um, but without you know, being in full gown and headdress, et cetera, each and every day, all day. Um, you've really got to be very careful. And this is where I've got the concern though. You've got to be careful in managing the risks, absolutely, but what levels, what levels of risks are there? The actual treatment that you're undertaking or the procedure gives you a very good clue. Um, is there any thought about, you know, how much protection should we be using or guidance in terms of what, apart from the obvious, I suppose, um, what treatments, procedures that really do require more heavily PPE use? Or it's left to the individual to work it out themselves. I mean, we've already talked about a lot of the guidelines. I don't think it's, it's not, it's not a perfect world. It'll never be completely a hundred percent safe. We just got to get, get the balance right. Yes. I mean, and that's what the whole thing, the whole webinar has been about essentially. Um, I mean, obviously with the perioral stuff, you, you, you need some fluid um, shields and, and some barrier there. You'll never have that, you'll never be able to stop that inadvertent sneeze when you're not ready for it, you know? So there's always a possibility of an infection. You just got to mitigate the risk as much as you can. And as Naveen said, all the layers on top of each other, the end result is a quite a good result. But there'll always be one or two cases that will be transmitted to the community with all the, the, um, the, the measures we've put in place as a society. Yeah, quite, absolutely. And Lawrence, you had a comment? Yeah, it's more that um, I, I think some people think we should be trying to get to some zero risk scenario and you mm. can't do that. Yeah. There's always going to be some, some measure of risk and you are trying to mitigate it as we've all talked about very well. And the main issue is that people simply don't wear the gear they've got now well. They, you see terrible mm -hmm. mask wearing, people don't adapt it to their face. If they are using an N95, they haven't done any proper fit testing or fit checking for it. So we need to use what we've got really well. That would be a really important message. And that gives you some protection, but nothing is going to be absolute. We don't want people to think they need to jump into a spacesuit or something like that. Mm. That's surely not appropriate. And it brings its own OHS problems along with it which are well documented, particularly from the SARS outbreak. It's not a good thing to spend all day uh, behind all that sort of gear. That brings me to another point then. The, um, will people get very tired? Well, we know they do get very tired of using the PPE consistently. So what, um, what are the possible risk factors in overuse of PPE? And I know if you're going to, and most of our treatments don't require 
uh, N95, for example, but wearing those all day, that's really complicated and really screws up your skin. So apart from good skin care, if you're using masks a lot, is there anything um, that to be aware of, you should be thinking about that you might get into overuse and therefore that would decrease your use of personal protective? David. And I guess I'm gonna speak from personal experience. Um, I've, I've gotten over the last six weeks pretty well used to wearing a mask, several masks all day plain surgical masks. And that's something I think that you can adapt to with it without too much difficulty as long as you don't try to rush and breathe too hard. I think um, I also wear full PPE when we do our coronavirus PCR tests at the practice when we're seeing febrile or sick people. And I reckon my limit wearing that stuff is about two hours. Once I get to about one and a half hours, I can't wait to get the stuff off. And once I get to about two hours, I'm just about going crazy with it on. And it takes all your willpower not to touch the mask, not to contaminate yourself with the equipment that you're wearing. And so the risks are, and I think also your dexterity can be affected, your vision can be affected by um, the eye protection you're wearing. And so I think you really need to have a think about, you know, if you're going to be wanting to do a procedure where you're going to have to wear all this full PPE, should you really be doing it at the moment? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of other things that could be done which may be considered lower risk um, that I think are a lot easier and you're not going to be, you know, struggling with all this stuff. Just since I mentioned earlier about donning and doffing and in my room I've got a chart on the wall and every time I put it on and take it off I'm looking at the chart and following it step by step every time because it's not necessarily instinctive and I don't want to get it wrong. Mm. Um, so I, I see the main risk in overusing it is getting yourself into trouble to be honest. Mm -hmm. This is something that um, we don't know, so we, but we presume that um, if you're comfortable with the protocols, you can be guaranteed with a degree of compliance that will be effective. So if you make things very hard and cumbersome, you're more likely f people are not going to use them, number one, and even if they use them, they're going to use them incorrectly. Now, even overseas, people have had uh, the full PPE gear starting from top to toe, hasn't prevented the uh, frontline workers, doctors and nurses and healthcare staff from getting uh, from acquiring COVID infection. So it's something to be mindful of. And we are kind of lucky in a way that the prevalence is very low and getting lower day by day. So the question is, do we need to have that um, uh, high level of PPEs when you're dealing with a low risk population? Mm. Quite, absolutely. I don't think we need to do the full space suit. And if, as David said, if you are doing that, then why are you doing it to begin with? Why are you wearing so much protection? You should just go to plan B, perhaps. Um, one question. In terms of the entirety of our sort of risk mitigation, what role does the client have in this? What, how far can we expect the client to know what they should be doing, other than us telling them what they need to be doing? in terms of protecting themselves while they're in our sort of area. Has anybody got any thoughts about that? The, from the client's perspective, what roles do they play? Because we've got our role, absolutely, but what role do they need to play? If I can say something, yeah. Terry. Um, what, one of the things that I believe we need to re 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 change at this point in time is the bringing a new culture of trust, collaboration, accountability, and honesty. And I think that needs to be, um, we need to be educated in that and communicate that to our clients as well as to our staff, because really it, it's about honesty, trust, and accountability that we work collaboratively towards prevention and mitigation. And it really, we, we as practitioners need to take that initiative to educate our clients, but also to um, it, it stimulate the issue of the, the moral 
consideration and the ethical issues that we owe as a community one to another. And we have to work collaboratively and honestly with one another. And I believe if through our communication, we uh, not only present the, the, the facts and the strategies, but also uh, bring it home to a point that where people can understand as, as individuals and as a community, um, honesty and collaboration and trust is very critical that we can stay on top of this. So um, I, I really would encourage some psychological element of um, accountability and trust to be communicated and cultivated in the culture of, of the this uh, this period of mm. time when when we are we have to show to the consumer that that we rely on them to be honest with us and to be accountable as much as we are to them. Right. Good point, actually, yes. So, Jennifer, have you got anything to add in terms of what the therapist or skincare professional um, could do in terms of getting more client compliance, essentially, in this new um, paradigm that the practice is going to be within? Um, I think it just starts with education um, from the point of contact. So when they're searching for you, obviously, on your website and those sorts of things, you need to have some sort of education for the consumer to be able to see what is going to be different, what you know, do we expect, what do we require of them, um, mm. and what the processes are going to be. So I think, yeah, that's probably the main thing is just increasing yeah. education. And doing it in a way that's not going to scare them off because exactly. there will be a lot of people not coming to the practitioner to begin with because of their own sort of fears and concerns. Uh, but those who do um, need to, yeah, conform to this new thing, whatever that new thing is, this new mitigation, risk mitigation. Uh, conscious of the time, and I think we've actually covered most of the questions. The only one that we didn't specifically cover was one that is the importance of evidence-based practice in infection control rationale. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave this to the panel because I'm all about EBP. That's my thing. Um, so I'm just, yeah, evidence-based. Where do we find the evidence, actually? I'm not going to get into the hierarchy of evidence and all that sort of stuff, but in a more general term, uh, evidence-based practice in our new protocols. So, Lawrence, perhaps uh, with you, yes. Um, just two interesting statistics for you. Um, since the COVID outbreak, there's a paper published roughly every 18 minutes on oh. some aspect of the infection. Um, I know because I've been tracking them every day and it's an yeah. awful lot of stuff to read. Um, there was a paper published this week, which was a scoping review on facial protection for healthcare workers during pandemics. And uh, they sieved through over 5,000 papers to end up with 67 that they then sieved down to give recommendations for. So there's actually some quite good pieces like this coming out, which are giving us you know, reasonably large agglomerated sets of information and data. And of course, there's a long history of dealing with all sorts of respiratory infections. And that's really the basis of what the NSMRC recommendations and the RACGP and other ones are built around anyway. It's really about, we know these things work, we know when they work, we know when they don't work. And it's actually more about compliance and education. I think it's back to Jennifer's point that it's keeping up an awareness. And I think the, the issue we face is that while COVID-19 is a thing, people will be interested in infection control, but what will happen in a year's time? Will everything just drop back and we'll see examples of a fairly poor mask wearing habits, for example, we'll see people wearing their scrubs to work and wearing them home. You know, what will it take for there to be a mind shift change that it's actually part of social responsibility? Mm. If that's the one thing we've learned from the COVID pandemic is that we're all responsible for other people, the people we go home to be with, the people we care for, the people we're next to on the bus, the random strangers we pass, we all have a social responsibility to each other. And doing infection control right is all part of that social responsibility. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Can I can I just add something to that, uh, Lawrence? I think I think it's a point well made. 
these stats show that uh, your uh, the incidence of uh, the flu same time this year compared to last year significantly lower and the things that have been attributed to that is that these all these public health measures now coming back to evidence the australian uh, clinical infection control they've got a you know a document that they publish once every year i think and that's been a good document to reference as a part of general infection protocol. Mm -hmm. The uh, Clinical Excellence Commission of New South Wales have got a very specific uh, COVID risk uh, mitigation for health workers. And in the uh, COVID-19 guide that uh, Greg Goodman and I uh, wrote, we have uh, referenced both of those documents and use that as a format. And Greg and I, along with a few authors, have just written a letter to the editor to summarize what is best practice in a cosmetic medical injecting space which has been put into the document that we have. So I think um, you're right that there is, there's a lot, lots of um, uh, guidelines and documentation for COVID specific treatments. But if you look at the world, there's multiple risk factors at multiple uh, geolocations. And uh, it's very hard to say that what is applicable in another part of the world is applicable here. Mm, true. David, we'll, we'll have to wrap this up because there's a couple of questions, um, but there's a few questions actually that are around the same thing, so that's okay. <laughs> Can I go ahead? David, yeah, sorry. To be honest, I like um, to keep things fairly simple. There's lots of good papers and publications and it can be hard for the average person to track all of, them down, all, all of those sources down. Health.gov.au the state health departments all have fantastic guides. I know I'm in Victoria, the DHHS um, of Health and Human Services has got um, a fantastic COVID-19 website and it's got specific recommendations for healthcare workers with regards to classification of patients or, or people who might be at risk and, and um, what sort of PPE should be wearing. and. I think that for good local knowledge, you can't go wrong by going from um, those sources. Uh, they're easy to get to, anyone can source them, and they incorporate the new data as it comes through the papers, like Lawrence has um, discussed that there's things being released every day, but they get updated almost on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, actually just a one that I read yesterday, it just come out in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and they looked at the surface stability of SARS-CoV-2. And, and they looked at plastics, cardboard, copper, stainless steel, and copper one outright. Um, stainless steel, probably the worst actually, uh, which was interesting. Cardboard was the worst, and then stainless steel, which is pretty amazing stuff to get those surfaces clean. We all went to stainless steel, now we've got to clean them even more. Uh, a couple of questions. One was about the mouthwash, but I think, uh, Naveen, you mentioned that um, one of the questions was Lawrence's point using mouthwash. How um, the time period prior to the treatment, should they use it? Now, I think it would be just immediately before rather than half an hour, do it at home and then come in. Yes, it, it could be immediately before the procedure, um, but you do get a suppression for around about two hours. So if it was, mm. you know, 15 minutes before, that would be perfectly fine too. Mm -hmm. um, and one about the mask, and you did mention it, the Bunnings dust mask routine. Uh, Officeworks have got 3M N95s evidently. Mm -hmm. Do you think they would be the real thing at Officeworks? <laughs> uh, 3M make about 20 different types of N95 masks. That's right. Yeah. All of the 19 are industrial and one is for health. Mm. <laughs> if you go on the web and search 3M mask catalogue, you'll notice they've got it coloured differently. And yep. all 3M masks have got a number which you can't miss. Mm. And as long as you're looking at the right number, then that's it. If you're not, then it isn't any good. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty much uh, anything I would think at Bunnings, Officeworks, etc. cetera. Um, probably not for medical purposes. So um, just any final questions because we're here to 8.15 and that's what it is right now. So um, any questions and Nicole, welcome back.
Um, oh, there you are. Yes. Welcome back, Nicole. So if there's no further questions, um, then, oh, somebody did ask about the articles that you mentioned um, that I think it was David who mentioned and uh, Naveen, you mentioned one, I think, with uh, Greg Goodman. Yeah. Where would they be located? Are they just on a med search or something? Yeah, the, the article that's been submitted to the journal hasn't been published yet. Right. But okay. based, based on, on that, there was a consensus group of about uh, eight physicians who uh, contributed to the article. And we've used uh, the pearls from that into the guidelines that uh, has been published on our website and uh, shared widely on social media. So if any of you go to the ASAP's uh, um, social media pages, there's usually maybe about a week ago, there was a post with a link uh, to where you can go and download this one. All it's right. a, quite a comprehensive document. It's quite easy to read and uh, that could be a good starting point. And as David said, the COVID crisis is changing. So if there's anything of significance, uh, then uh, that will be updated by the uh, state health boards. And we've said that to use this document, please read this in conjunction along with the uh, guidelines put out by the health uh, state departments. Mm. And I think that's the important thing to keep up to date, because as we know, changing almost daily as to what you can do, can't do, and that's going to continue. Um, and the state, each state uh, have got their own health department websites that have yep. the applicable information state by state. And we tried desperately not to mention specifics because there are some that are national but generally it's uh, down to the individual state what happens how you happen etc etc so um trisha's just she's just bombarding my phone with the messages uh and one that's just came in and i'll bring it to jennifer and uh tina perhaps to close in terms of um the question was Dermal therapists don't need to wear gowns then. Uh, we need more contextual information around that, I think. But as a general, do um, therapists need to wear gowns? Um, maybe if they're thinking of surgical gowns and possibly not, but um, as Jacinta said, there's lots and lots of situations where they should probably be wearing an apron. Um, mm. But again, it does down, come down to the, the procedure that you're performing and the risk. That yeah. I would say to a large extent, a disposable apron would be quite sufficient. Mm -hmm. I don't see dermal therapists and such needing full surgical gowns. No. No. Anybody else on that comment? No? Yeah, I, think, I think the apron, disposable apron is, is sufficient. Yes. Um, especially if it's a procedure where you may be coming in contact with the client or the patient. Yes. Well, Personally, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and letting me have some control over this. That was wonderful. And thank you for your contributions to the discussion. I'd now like just to hand it back to Nicole uh, and thank her for getting such a distinguished panel together for a time. So thank you individually for your time and your efforts here. And Nicole, thank you also. Thank you, Terry. Now, I think we um, are all very grateful to you. You've done an amazing job. There was one last question is, um, from Ada. Is 70% alcohol enough for cleaning surfaces? Depends what alcohol, number one. Anybody want to take that up, though? I'll leave it. Is 70% alcohol? Or does it have to be isopropyl? Or does it have to be this or that? I'm thinking is behind mm. that question. She'd be referring to IPA, so isopropyl alcohol. Possibly, don't know. Yeah. No, she is. Yeah. It is, mm, it, it is one of the, it is one of the products mentioned um, together with um, dilute sodium hypochloride, as well as any uh, TGA approved uh, surface disinfectant product, which will be either listed or registered, uh, registered if it has evidence and listed if it has equivalency. So yeah, there's a lot of good products in the market in that space, and this is not a, Particularly difficult virus to inactivate, fortunately. So. Hmm. Yeah, I think we've got to be looking at you know percentages. Yes, a ten percent alcohol is not quite going to do the deal. Hospital grade, yes. Antiviral, most definitely. Antibacterials, nice, but this is a virus, people. 
Mm. Any last thoughts then? And I will then give it back to Nicole yet again. Okay, well, one last comment about disinfecting your mobile phones. Just oh, good follow, one, yes. Follow your manufacturer's instructions because if you use alcohol of a certain nature, it will deactivate your touch screen. Yes. So just be mindful of that. But uh, I think Apple has instructions how to deactivate your phone. Uh, sorry, uh, clean your phone and so does uh, Samsung Android. Mm -hmm. uh, just one oh, comment about the mobile phones. We actually just use Ziploc bags for our phone for the day and, and throw the, the bag out and, uh, um, and use a new bag every day just to avoid contact with the phone as well. Mm. And that again with the client phone, because they'll be diving into their bags to get the phone out or whatever, using it and putting it back and having chaos all throughout. So just one other thing to think about, what are you going to deal with? Uh, how are you going to deal with the client phones? Thank you, Nicole. I'll shut up now. I will let everybody go and go to bed, even though I think we could talk all night. I'd love to ask 101 questions of all of the um, incredible panellists. Um, uh, Professor Walsh, it was lovely um, to meet you tonight, and I'm sure um, the other panellists who haven't met you are, are extremely grateful that you have shared your, your insight and knowledge tonight. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me along, Nicole. And uh, well, thank you, Tina Viney, yeah. who, um, who created that, that introduction. It's, it's incredible how we've all uh, connected. And um, I absolutely uh, appreciate your time, Ron, Naveen, Jacinta, uh, Jennifer, and, um, and of course, Trish and Nancy, who um, have helped me incredibly. Thank you, ladies. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.